Excellent. So for the folks that are joining us who are just getting online, uh, welcome. I'm Julia Robertson with Ocean Conservancy, Vice President of Communications. Really excited to have everyone here to join us in a conversation about Florida's oceans and coasts. We're going to have a great conversation tonight. I'm just going to chatter while we get um, people online and while people are joining us. It's probably the end of some of someone's uh, working day. So we're gonna give people a minute to get settled. Um, you'll hear me chattering away and um, I'll let you know when we're ready to get started. If you don't already follow Ocean Conservancy on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, I encourage you to do so. Facebook, we're at uh, just Ocean Conservancy. Twitter is our ocean and Instagram is Ocean Conservancy. So, Sign up for our emails, follow along on those channels, and uh, we'll get started in a few minutes. And thanks again for everyone who's joining us today. We are having a conversation with JP Brooker, our head of our Florida program, and Captain Benny Blanco, fly fishing guide. And um, we are gonna get started in just a few minutes. Bear with us while we get people situated and settled and working out any Zoom challenges. And um, we'll be with you shortly. Great, it looks like we've already got a great number of participants. We're really excited to chat with you all. Thank you for taking an hour out of your day to join uh, Ocean Conservancy and Captain Benny Blanco. I'm going to wait for a signal from our uh, Zoom mastermind since it's not quite five o'clock Eastern. We won't get started yet, but thank you all for joining us. Thank you to those who are a little bit early. We really appreciate it. And for those that were early and have heard me say this a few times, uh, apologies, but please be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, be sure to sign up for our emails so we can keep you informed um, about future events like these. And thanks for experimenting with us. This is um, a relatively new format for us. We're excited to try it. Um, we are pretty sure that it won't go perfectly, um, but uh, we're really excited that we can have this conversation with you all, have this conversation with JP and with Benny. We're gonna have a good, um, a good chat, so. Bear with us as we get folks online. Excellent, it looks like we've got folks joining. Hi everyone, for people who've just joined, I'm Julia Robertson with Ocean Conservancy. I'm gonna be helping to kick off this conversation with Captain Benny Blanco and JP Brooker. And uh, we're just letting people get settled into the Zoom room and um, we'll get started soon. So thanks for joining us. Excellent. Okay, we've got a few more people joining. Again, thank you. We're having a good conversation tonight about Florida, Florida's oceans and coasts, and um, with a fantastic conservationist uh, with us tonight in conversation with the head of our Florida program, J.P. Brooker. So thanks everybody for spending an hour with us. We're just waiting for people to get online um, and we'll get started shortly. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, the good news is you won't hear from me during the majority of the conversation, because I'm sure you're getting sick of my voice, but I'm just helping to welcome everybody in. Uh, just a quick reminder to uh, follow us on Facebook, um, Instagram, or uh, Twitter, so we can be sure to keep you updated and informed with all the news, all the ocean news, um, as well as what's happening in the state of Florida. Um, we've still got a few people joining. I'm just checking um, the list. Um, so bear with us. Thanks in advance for joining. And we'll get started momentarily.
Excellent. I can see a few more people joining. Fantastic. Thanks everyone for spending an hour with us towards the end of your day. We're going to have a great conversation with Captain Benny Blanco and JP Brooker. We're excited to talk about some of the pressing issues facing Florida's oceans and coasts. And, um, and we really appreciate the questions that have been sent in advance that our two panelists are going to cover. Uh, we'll also take the time for some questions for those of you on the phone that haven't been able to um, provide those questions yet. So don't worry, I will go through all of this again. Um, but again, thank you everyone for joining us. Please be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and sign up for our emails. And I'm just waiting on our mastermind behind the scenes to tell me when we can fully get started. All right, we got one minute to go. We've still got a few people and we're just helping them on the back end, making sure that video and sound and all that is working. Excellent, just saw a bunch of new people join. Thanks everyone, I'm Julia Robertson with Ocean Conservancy. We're gonna get started in just a minute. All righty, I think we are about ready to join. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, for those of you who just joined us, I'm Julia Robertson, Vice President of Communications at Ocean Conservancy, and welcome. Thank you so much for participating in this virtual event, Currents and Crossroads. We're gonna have a great conversation with Ocean Conservancy on Florida's incredible um, and also threatened ocean and coastal environments. So. Um, this is a new experience for us. We're trying out Zoom like so many of you. I know you probably spent a lot of time on Zoom and online in recent weeks, so we really appreciate you spending another hour out of your day with us, and we're going to make it entertaining and informative. Um, please be patient if there's any technological glitches. There probably will be, but we will sort through them together, and I'm just going to run through a couple of the Zoom basics for everyone. Um, so hopefully you've already figured this out, but to listen, you're going to click the join audio button in the bottom left corner of your screen. This is going to give you the option to listen depending on what a uh, device um, you're on. If you're having any difficulties, please send a chat to the host directly um, and they can probably help you figure that out. Um, after the main program, we are going to have a short Q&A session, and some people, like I mentioned, have already submitted questions ahead of time. But you're also welcome to ask a question by clicking the Q&A button in the bottom middle of your screen, which you all should be able to see. Uh, so like I mentioned, I'm Julia. I'm here to just kick this process off. Um, and with Ocean Conservancy, I'm Vice President of our Communications. We are all here because we love Florida and we're excited to talk to you about the health of Florida's oceans and coasts and what we can all do about it. So just a quick bit of background on Ocean Conservancy. Many of you know us and have um, supported or worked with us or volunteered with us over the years and we're so grateful for that support. Um, for us and for, uh, for the ocean and for the coast that we all love. Ocean Conservancy has worked in Florida for more than three decades, I believe, and we're known for our deep bench of science and policy expertise, our strategic advocacy and outreach chops, and we work on some of the greatest challenges facing the ocean. And what makes us different is that we do it with partners. We believe that the problems facing the ocean are too big to solve alone. And that is why we work with wonderful people like Captain Benny Blanco, which is someone who's here with us today and we'll hear a little bit more about. 
Uh, every year we want rerun the International Coastal Cleanup. So it's the world's largest single day volunteer event on behalf of the ocean. And in 2018, more than 30,000 volunteers picked up almost half a million pounds of trash from Florida's beaches and waterways. And so we are so grateful to all of those that have participated in an International Coastal Cleanup um, and, and recognize that this year it may look a little different, but there's, there's still things that we can do and that we need to be tracking for Florida's oceans and coasts. So today we're gonna to talk to you about some of those things, uh, including sea level rise and water quality. We'll be joined by JP Bricker, who is head of Ocean Conservancy's Florida program, and Benny, Captain Benny Blanco, host of Guiding Flow TV, a Fox Sports show that is equal parts fishing and conservation. So I just wanna give a brief bit of background on our speakers. So JP was born and raised in Florida on the Indian River Lagoon in Brevard County. His family first came to Florida from the Bahamas in the 1850s, eventually settling in Key West and Tampa. JP is based in our St. Petersburg office. He's got deep expertise in uh, federal fisheries issues in the southeastern United States, as well as on Capitol Hill, which is where I am in Washington, D.C. He has expertise in coastal and conservation issues in Florida, including water quality, sea level rise, ocean acidification, and ocean trash and plastics. And JP is also an avid diver and enjoys spearfishing, surfing, fly fishing, and he and his wife are raising his two young daughters to love and care for Florida's oceans and coasts. And now I'm excited to introduce and tell you a little bit more about Captain Benny Blanco. So Benny is an award-winning conservationist, fishing guide, and television host. Benny spends most of his time deep in the home waters of the Everglades. I think you were like just coming back from there as we were getting this whole thing set up, which is awesome. I want to hear about that. Um, so you primarily fish out of Flamingo and Everglades National Park. And Benny is famous for putting his clients on tarpon, bonefish, redfish, and snook, among many other species. He's also well known for his outspokenness on water quality and abundance issues, especially in South Florida. So we're thrilled to have you with us today, Benny. Thank you. Thanks so let me talk a little bit about what the event's going to look like. So we're going to have a poll question, which I believe our host is going to display in a minute. Uh, that'll display on your screen and you'll be able to, to vote. Then we'll turn it over to Benny and JP to have a conversation on some of the issues that I've just discussed. We'll take some of the questions that were sent over in advance, as well as ones from those on the phone. Um, we're going to show you our Ocean to Everglades trailer, which we're excited to um, excited for you all to see. We'll send that out in an email um, after this event. Um, and then we will wrap up and you will be able to enjoy the rest of the evening. And so with that, let's see if the poll question can display. All right, so everyone should be able to see this, but I'll read it out as well. Wherever you go in Florida, you are never more than how many miles from the beach or the ocean? Hopefully everybody's answering that. I'm getting the results. I'm not seeing the results. All right, almost everyone has answered and congratulations. You all know Florida really well because the correct answer was 60 miles, right? Is that right, JP? That's correct, you got Excellent. it. Excellent, so is everyone seeing that? 62% of you said 60 miles. You're never more than 60 miles from the beach or the ocean in Florida. So thanks everyone, that's a great way to kick us off. And with that, I'm thrilled to turn it over to JP and Benny. Take it away. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Benny, so much for joining us. It's just, it's an honor to have you with us. And, you know, I think we can have a really interesting conversation today. Um, I'd love to start in the Everglades. That's where you fish. That's where, that's your bread and butter. For me, you know, the ecosystems of South Florida, the Everglades, Florida Bay, they've been like an indelible and special place for me since as far back as I can remember. Uh, my parents had a copy of this book, Campfires of the Everglades. I don't know if it's coming up the right way, um, but I remember, you know, looking through this book, flipping through this book and just being captivated by 
you know, the stories of the, the natural wilderness. This book came out in 1890, you know, and here's some tarpon fishing uh, being done in Florida Bay as far back as then. Um, when I was nine or 10, I was sent to summer camp at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's Everglades Youth Camp, which I think is actually up in, in Palm Beach County. But nevertheless, it left such a mark on me. I recall when my dad came, when my dad came to pick me up after a week at that camp, I was, you know, he was worried that I was sick because I looked so miserable. And it's because I didn't want to leave, you know? And it was around then that I really dedicated myself to a life of conservation. And, you know, as a young man and, and an adult, I've spent countless hours like you, you know, on skiffs and, 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 you know, fishing on canoes or anything that floats practically, just poking around Loxahatchee, Big Cypress, Holy Land, Dinner Island, uh, Everglades National Park, 10,000 Islands, anywhere I could get to some water, I would get to it. And, you know, it's not just us who have been motivated by, you know, conservation for these kind of amazing waterways. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the, the Floridian identity. You know, you've got books like, like Totch, you know, this is a, the story of a life in the Everglades by Lauren Totch Brown, just a, a legendary gladesman. You got books like, I just picked these books off my shelf just because I, I happened to come into my office for this interview. And, and, you know, we've got, you know, this, this legendary canon of glades literature. Uh, gladesmen, gator hunters, moonshiners, and skiffers by Glenn Simmons. One of my favorites. Uh, an excellent book. I think there's even instructions for how to build a skiff in the back, actually. Mm -hmm. um, Forever Island by Patrick Smith, who actually lived on Merritt Island, where I grew up, wrote this story in the 1970s, uh, you know, about the Seminole experience and, you know, the, the encounters with overdevelopment of the, of the glades. And of course, you know, the, the, the go-to book, you know, uh, River, of River of Grass by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. I mean, this is the book that kicked off the Everglades conservation movement, you know. Right. And so the Everglades and Florida Bay have really clearly captivated people's imagination for such a long time. And so my question to you, Benny, to get this kicked off is what is it about these ecosystems, about the Everglades, about Florida Bay, about the Upper Keys, about the 10,000 islands, about these places that you fish that has captivated you? Um, that's an extremely loaded question. Well, first, I'll, I'll say thank you so much for having me. Um, I appreciate having a platform to speak about water issues, about Florida Bay, about the Everglades, about Florida. Uh, at any drop of a hat, I'm, I'm there. And so I'm very appreciative of the platform. Um, I think for me, what immediately captivated me as a child was the remoteness. I grew up in Miami and uh, in Miami, you can't blink an eye without seeing a building or a sidewalk or concrete or, or people. And well, the first time I went to the Everglades, I was just dumbfounded by the fact that I was surrounded by mangroves and water and animals that I'd only previously seen on television. And, um, and all of it was right there and it was ours. It's, we own that park, that is everyone's park. And, um, and so I, I was captivated by that, that I don't know, that, um, that thrill of exploration, of the ability to go out and get lost. And it was, you're welcome to do it. And so um, I was captivated initially by that. And then when I became, to, when I came to know the wildlife a little bit better, I was blown away by what was available for us to see and witness right there. Um, and then the fishing is, I mean, it's world-class. It literally is one of the top five destinations on the planet for any fisherman, whether you are a cane pole fisherman or you are the world-class fly fisherman. Um, everything exists, everything that you would want to catch or target exists in the Everglades National Park and, and or the ancillary uh, ecosystems that surround it. Um, and, um, and so you have that sense of, you know, wildness. You have the unlimited um, species of animals that surround you and then the best fishing on the planet. I, anyone, everyone that I've ever taken there for, the, for their first time, their first trip has always come back with that same feeling that you had with your dad on that camping trip, that first trip, which was, I don't want to leave. And, uh, and, and as you are leaving, because you have to, when am I coming back? Um, and that's part of the, the, the issue that I struggle with when I go to Tallahassee or DC or Palm Beach, and I'm trying to get people to understand how important this place is, how special, how magical, and how, how much healing powers are there. You can't, explain it with words. You can't explain it with pictures or videos. And we try our best. 
um, the only way to do it is to actually experience it. Yeah, completely. I agree. I mean, there's no um, substitute for deep immersion into the glades or into Florida Bay. It's just so, so remote. I think you put it so perfectly. So what is it about that remoteness that's worth preserving? And what are the threats that are making preserving it challenging that you're seeing firsthand in your decades on the water? Sure. From, I'll give you a couple of different perspectives. From a fisherman's perspective, there are no other there is not another place like Florida Bay on this planet. It is the only place where you can target permit, bonefish, tarpon, snook, and redfish in the same day. It doesn't exist anywhere else. So it's from, a, from a fishing destination perspective, it has to be preserved for just that right. Then for also from a fishing perspective, it is where 65 or 68, something like that percent of all of the world records for permit and bonefish have come from. So from a, from a historic fishing perspective, you have to protect it. Uh, from a human perspective, there are no other Everglades on the planet. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas said it, what, 60 years ago in her book? Um, it lit she literally opened up the entire movement for Everglades restoration with that one paragraph. And it hammers it home. There are no other Everglades in the world. Some people will drive through there and not understand what's there. Um, you know, they'll see, you know, vast, you know, expanses of sawgrass and and mangroves and brown water and they're you know they're like wow this is, this is you know we should build on this this is you know this is perfect land to build on and, but the majority of us will go out there and look and be captivated by the place that, that exists about the healing powers and the ability to get out and go out and get lost um and then additionally from a human perspective we don't have a lot of wild places left we truly don't um uh, there are people who will say that there are too many public places, but I'll tell you, I've been around the, the state quite a bit in the last couple of years filming, and there are very few wild, truly wild places left. And I think we're at a stage in our um, progress as a, as, a, as a race that we have to start protecting all the wild places we have left with everything we have. And uh, in the Everglades, has proven over and over and over again its value from a human uh, value perspective and um, and so from as far as I'm concerned there are so many positive reasons to, to protect the Everglades that that's why you'll find me at every single place to talk about it and to advocate for it and for, for all those reasons yeah I love that and you are all over the place talking about it so that is awesome you know but so when I think about you know your fishery when I think about Florida Bay um, you know, I think of some serious problems that we're really working hard to fix. You know, a lot of groups are working hard to fix, but the problems I'm thinking about are sea level rise, which impacts habitat, it impacts salinity, um, it impacts, uh, you know, the overall health of the fishery uh, when animals are displaced and, you know, when they don't have that natural habitat that they rely on. Um, I think about water quality issues with harmful algal blooms and those kinds of things. Can you talk a little bit about what you personally feel is the single greatest threat impacting your fishery right now? And, you know, what, what should be done immediately to fix that threat? Sure. Uh, it's, honestly, it's a really simple thing. Um, Everglades restoration is complicated, there's no doubt. There's a lot of projects, but it's simple. The, the solution is simple. We, we need to restore fr clean freshwater flow down through Everglades National Park into Florida Bay. That, doing that solves all of the problems above. Um, Florida Bay is, is in a constant state of hypersalinity. Um, and for those who don't understand what that is, that's, that's when we are dealing with way too much salt. Currently, we're taking ref refractometer readings on a daily basis in Florida Bay that, uh, that rate anywhere from 37 to 40 parts per thousand, which is saltier than seawater. Um, in a bay that has been historically brackish. It's, it's, a, it's a brackish estuary. And uh, all of the critical game fish in the state of Florida rely on that brackish estuary at some point in their life. And uh, we, haven't, we have not had a brackish estuary in, in Florida Bay in decades. Um, the, our best years are years when there's a decent balance between saltier than seawater and some fresh. And, um, but never in a completely brackish scenario like it was historically. Um, that solves a couple problems. One of the bigger issues that people will identify with immediately is what we saw in the news two years ago, which were the, the Lake Okeechobee discharges that went to the east and the west coast, and the St. Lucie River and the Coosahatchee. 
And that was the result of the damming of the water that we have around Lake Okeechobee. And as you know, when, that, when we have a, rainy se- a heavy rainy season, the lake cannot, take, cannot hold uh, water without being threatened of damaging the dam. And whenever there's a threat of damaging the dam, the Army Corps has no choice at this point except to send water east and west to estuaries that never historically got that fresh water. And that's, that's damaging enough, right? To send fresh water into a saltwater ecosystem, you know, from zero to 400 million gallons in a day, um, that's, that'll, that'll destroy any ecosystem. But what's worse than that is that those legacy nutrients that are in the lake and the nutrients that come from big ag and urban development all around the central, central Florida, uh, they, they, they collect in the lake and then they're discharged into those estuaries. So not only are they getting all that fresh water, but they're getting high nutrient, high phosphorus, high nitrate water that completely destroys everything. On the West Coast, it causes this, this supercharged red tide. Red tide already exists in the Gulf, you know, you know historically, um, offshore. But when that red tide hits, that supercharged, I mean, that, that high nutrient water that comes out of Lake Okeechobee becomes a supercharged red tide. And we saw that in 2018 where it literally killed everything. Dolphins, turtles, seagrass. I mean, everything. Uh, we saw birds falling out of the sky. It's, that's terrible. I and mean, that, that should never happen in the state of Florida. The state of Florida is a tourism-based economy. Um, there's, no, there's no debating that. You know, $120 billion a year or something like that. Um, and this one issue around the lake and Everglades restoration is destroying three estuaries and, and every estuary in between. So if we can um, continue to rally around Everglades restoration, and place a high priority on projects in the Central Everglades plan, which include that reservoir that we got approved in 2016, that was just recently got a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers, that they just recently mobilized to start building um, with the South Florida Water Management District. Prioritizing that, making that a, a priority to happen now, means that we can collect that water that, that is full of phosphates and, and, and nitrogen, and we can treat it, clean it, and send it into, every, into the Everglades National Park. And that solves a couple problems. One is we don't send, we're not sending as much fresh water to east and west when there's a major rainy situation, and we're sending fresh water into Florida Bay. Um, and Florida Bay desperately needs that fresh water for the hypersalinity issue, but more importantly, because of the compounding of sea level rise in Florida Bay. Um, so if Florida Bay is not getting that fresh water from the Everglades, it's already in a hypersaline situation. You add sea level rise, and now it's super hypersaline, and our in our are uh, the opportunity for us to have a scenario like we had in 2015 where we had these big algal blooms that were caused by hypersaline, situ- uh, uh, super hypersaline situations um, will become more frequent. And, and what we've seen in Florida Bay is we've had two in the last 35 years and it, they're completely devastating. They, de- they destroy the bay, the fishing, and the, enti- the economies that surround them. So, um, it's a complicated process to get there, but the solution is simple. It's clean water back down through Everglades National Park into Florida Bay. Yeah, I mean, that, what a perfect answer. You know? And you, you, you hit so many points. I had a follow-up question for you since you're there seeing it. Um, there's a drought right now. April is traditionally the driest month in Florida. It's kind of in between the dry, end of the dry season and the beginning of hurricane season. Um, but we're also compounding the fact that April is the driest month with a historic drought. I'm wondering if you're seeing those impacts in the Everglades with respect to, um, you know, water getting into Florida Bay or the, a lack of water. And also, frankly, if you're worried about uh, an increased risk of fires impacting your access to the fishery down there in Florida Bay and just what that drought is doing for your uh, general outlook. Sure. I mean, I always talk from a fisherman's perspective because that's that's my you know that's my professional opinion and uh, but I can also tell you because of, I've been involved in all these meetings that when we have these major drought problems uh, and and no water at all on the Taylor Slough side which is the eastern side of the glades it causes major issues for wading birds uh, it causes major issues for the peat that's that's the top layer of soil in, in the glades that once it gets dried out it 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 basically washes away, and the peat, the peat literally is the, the foundation for all that's healthy in Everglades National Park. Um, increased opportunity for wildfire, there's no doubt. I mean, we're seeing, we saw a huge wildfire yesterday in the Everglades National Park um, that, that desperately 
uh, needs attention. And, and of course, every time there's a major issue like that, it takes resources, it takes the entire, the entire park to, to come to the rescue and it shouldn't be that way. Um, we should have these reservoirs in place. We should have fresh water coming down, replenishing Taylor Slough when we have rains and it should never get so dry that the peat is being washed away. Um, shame on us for allowing it to be that way, but there are so many domino effect issues that come from hypersaline drought conditions that absolutely could be fixed right now. Um, you know, we started this, this, uh, Central Everglades Restoration Plan in, two, in the year 2000. It was a 30-year plan, right? It was, no, I'm sorry, it was a 20-year plan. And, and we were at 20 years. We've seen one of the 68 projects completed. We've seen over a billion, or was it a billion dollars? Two billion dollars, something like, something ridiculous that I couldn't even fathom had been spent on Everglades Restoration, but nothing had been done. Um, and it's just part of the, the hurdles that we've dealt with in Everglades Restoration. There's so many projects. There's so many complicated issues. There's so many sh stakeholders, and they all have different opinions. And um, I think if we could ever get to a common ground, which is that we all have to focus on sending fresh water south, it'll solve everyone's problems in one way or another. And uh, once we can start sending fresh water south, then you don't have the peak going away. You don't have uh, these increased uh, risk of, uh, of major fires. You don't have hyper saline, saline situations in Florida Bay. And your all your economy, your economies are running. When your economies are running, obviously you can spend more money on other things. Um, so um, the domino effect. I wish I could list all the things for you, JP, but I can tell you that it's it's vast, and every one of the stakeholders has a different issue that's key to them. That is a result of not sending that freshwater south. Yeah, um, I think you nailed it there for sure. I mean, it's really a complicated network with a fairly uncompli uncomplicated solution, you know, a network of stake stakeholders with a singular uncomplicated solution. Um, let's shift gears a little bit um, and let's talk about fishing since you are a fishing guide. You know, Florida is the sport fishing capital of the world. You, you touched on this. People come from all over the planet to come fishing in Florida, uh, whether it's Amelia Island or the dry tortugas everywhere in between on the East Coast where I grew up on the Indian River Lagoon. Um, all the way up the west coast of Florida, all the way to the Panhandle. People are, are fishing inshore, offshore. Every single square inch of Florida's water is fishable and people are fishing in it. And, you know, um, at this point, you're a legendary fisherman in your own right. You know, you, you are. You've worked, you, you, you're on TV. Um, you've worked and fished with some true Florida fishing icons as well, whether that's Flip Pallet or, um, you know, whether it's C.A. Richardson, who, who does flash class. Uh, you know, and many others. Um, and so can you tell me a singular story about a legendary fishing trip, like one that really stands out and what made it so special? Sure. So uh, I have fished with a lot of legends. Um, there's no doubt. And, and those days are near and dear to my heart. There's no doubt. I have a couple of days on the water with Flip Pallet and um, Stu Apt and uh, I mean, just They'll, I'll, I'll go to my grave remembering those days, there's no doubt. My favorite day on the water ever was with Peter Mathiasen, uh, who is an award-winning American novelist who passed away a few years ago. He wrote um, Killing Mr. Watson, Shadow Country. Uh, the list of books that he wrote are just uh, crazy good. And he was a walking encyclopedia for everything historic in everybody's national park. And um, I pulled him, I'm, I fished with him a few times, but I got to fish with him in Florida Bay on his last trip in the Florida Bay. And um, every island had an, an amazing story. And he was particularly uh, vocal that day. And um, some of the stories that he's, you know, that he shared were just, you know, I felt like I was getting a private view into history. You know, we, we joke all the time about, you know, if I can go back to the 40s and, you know, for one day, oh, my God, it would be tremendous. And I feel like that day I, I did go back in time. And, um, and that, was, that was very special. And, and Peter, um, I know he really appreciated the friendship and the ability to get out in Florida Bay and see it for himself and fish it. And, um, you know, I, and I fully believe that right now, if he was here and in good health, he'd be on this call. So he could talk in, in about Everglades restoration and the, and the importance of Florida's waterways. Yeah, that story um, 
Shadow Country, you know, is sort of a legendary book in my opinion. And and it, for those that don't know, it tells the story of this, you know, epic bully in Chuck Lusky, um, who basically the whole town turned out to to dispatch and get rid of more or less um, the killing of Mr. Watson. Um, but yeah, well, that's amazing. I mean, what a, what an incredible, you know, person to have out on your boat. Just a, an inc like, what an experience. Um, Lefty Cray, who uh, you knew and had met, who is literally, he literally wrote the book on fly fishing, Ultimate Guide to Fly Fishing. Um, just a legendary fisherman in his own right. Um, he said, uh, there's more BS in fly fishing than in a Kansas feedlot. And I personally, I mean, I'm an aspiring fly fisherman after decades of trying to do it. I'm not very good at it, but I like to try. I personally think he's talking a lot about the complexities of fly fishing and, you know, all of the elaborations that it's kind of picked up over the years, um, you know, to what has historically been called the quiet sport. But I'm interested to know what you think and has the, the sport of fly fishing changed since you first got started? Sure. Um, Lefty was a treasure. I mean, there will never be another lefty. There's no doubt. He was, you could put him in a room, give him any topic, and he could entertain any audience for as much time as you needed to. Um, he could make you fall in love with fly fishing, even if you had never seen a fly rod before in your life. Uh, he was very, very special. I think his comment of re regarding BS and fly fishing had more to do with um, the average person who becomes a fly fisherman is full of poop. Um, I think that's where he was coming from. And, uh, you know, I see it on a daily basis. I get guys who call, you know, it's the typical call, uh, Captain Benny, I've been fly fishing for 30 years. And that's a sure tail sign from a guide in a guide's world that that guy has no idea what he's doing. No, and never th really thrown a fly rod and you're in for a long day on the water. Um, but fly fishing has come, I mean, uh, leaps and bounds since I was a kid. Uh, when I was a kid, it was something that was, you know, that I romanticized about because a couple of these older guys who made it look super, you know, cool. And it was just this like unreachable, I don't know, tier of fishing that you had to be extremely, you know, talented to do. And now, um, you know, I'm, I got five-year-olds and six-year-olds coming on the boat with fly rods and they're watching YouTube and learning how to do it in their backyard. And they come on the boat and they have a double haul. Is better better caster than the guy, the guy who came from Montana who's been fly fishing for 30 years. Now it's just a totally different game, um, uh, and that's and that's amazing. And and I think uh, that lends itself more to what we are trying to do, which is uh, what I'm specifically trying to do, and I know you are too. Um, through the show, is to change the culture of fishing. When I was a kid, the culture was you fill the cooler, and you come home and you show everybody where the fish you caught, and that's that was how you, you, you rated your day, you know? And, um, and everybody had to eat for months off of the cooler, the cooler full of fish. And, and I don't know how I didn't see that when I was younger, how that it's not a sustainable scenario. Um, but I certainly realized that as I became a guide and, um, probably more as the guiding business picked up when, you know, when I was young guide in Flamingo, there was maybe five guides in Flamingo. And now there's 350 registered guides in Everglades National Park. And so as I saw the number of guides going up and the number of guide, professional guides on a daily basis, cleaning snook and redfish every day at the, at the marina, I thought, oh, we can't do this. This is, you know, I want to be able to share the fish, this fishing with my grandkids one day. And so um, fly fishing is totally different than that. And, um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to change that culture from let's take, 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 you know, we are owed this fish and these, this ability to, that we have this right to fish all these places to we are privileged to have these places and we have to do everything we can to protect them because they're not guaranteed. They're not going to be here forever unless we do. Um, and we should only take fish on the rarest occasion that we're going to eat them that night. Um, and we should absolutely respect the fish uh, for what they, what they serve in this, in this, in our economy and in, in our lives and, um, I know that if I couldn't go out and target fish that my life would be, I mean, I might be in jail somewhere. Um, I, you know, I, I have to go fish. So for me to have fish out there to go target and to, to hunt and to catch and, and to protect is, is my livelihood. So um, I think fly fishing has come a long way. 
I think the majority of the inshore guides have, have migrated to more fly fishing. I certainly have. And I think that's good for the conservation movement. Yeah, and this is probably the last question I'll ask uh, before we move over to some other questions and answers from some other folks. But you kind of you you kind of read my mind actually, which was to to talk a little bit about the the fact that you're the host of Guiding Flow TV on Fox Sports now and on Waypoint. Is it or, or uh, it's also online on wait, where is it on, on, way, on, on Waypoint. Waypoint on Waypoint as well. And you know that shows equal parts um, fishing and conservation, and and you have that conservation ethic interwoven um you know that message permeates the entire show and so my question to you is are you see are you seeing people awakening to the need for conservation in florida and you know can you just go into what you're seeing people's uptake of that message being a little bit absolutely thank you for the opportunity to talk about it um guiding flow tv you can find it on waypoint um waypoint is a streaming option and is also available on all of the streaming applications, Hulu, Roku, Apple, et cetera. Um, and we did that, I did that specifically because my entire game for this show is to, is to get people to watch it. And um, in the first month, now we've had two shows launched in the first month, we have over 3 million views in those first two episodes. Um, and that's a, that's a, answers your question. Um, are people interested in what, what, what the conservation message is? And that is yes, absolutely. Um, we've seen changes in the industry since my first show a year and a half ago. Uh, prior to my first show a year and a half ago, none of the, the TV hosts talked about conservation. None of them talked about the need to protect our water or to put fish back or to only take what you need. None of them did. Now, every single one of them does. As a matter of fact, a lot of the shows have a segment where they talk about the importance of the water that they're fishing. And, uh, and or highlight that captain that they're fishing with the, for those reasons. Um, I, believe, uh, I believe that we've changed the way um, the companies in our industry now approach their marketing budgets. Uh, I believe that they're, they're, they're freeing up money and assigning it to conservation for that purpose because they're understanding that the entire industry is looking more that way. Um, I'm certainly not where I want to be yet, where everyone in the industry is, is conservation minded, but we're getting there. Um, and I think that the shows like this are a huge step. They're not the answer. Uh, I really didn't think it was going to be, you know, this, I'm going to go out and educate everybody and that's it. Everybody's going to be good. Uh, I, it's a long-term process. Um, I, I am, um, I want to say that the show is probably 80% conservation and 20% fishing. Um, because honestly, I can make a show without fish. Uh, my, my story is more about the area, about what's going on there, and about educating. And we catch fish because we identify that the average person on a Saturday morning isn't going to want to talk about water and doesn't want to hear about how bad the water is or what we got to do to fix it. They want to see fish. So we show them fish. And while we're showing them fish, we're educating the crap out of them. Um, because that's the only formula that's going to work. Um, people aren't going to show up to town halls and they're not going to show up to um, you know, a, a classroom to talk about what water, is, what the problems with water are. They're they're going to watch a fishing show though, and they are. And um, and I'm I'm really thankful that I had the opportunity to get started on that last year. And I'm so grateful for the companies who are supporting us this year to get us there. Um, and I think it's it's a really good indication that this industry is turning the table on that initial take 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 mentality and and really trying to put back into you know these places that have molded us into who we are. I think you're so right. It really is exciting to see and, um, you know, congratulations. I mean, it's a really great show and you should be really proud of yourself for it. And thank you. I'm really glad to see, um, you know, the uptake that it is getting. Um, Julia, uh, I think we're probably about ready to look at some other questions. We are. So thank you, Benny and JP. That was fantastic. We, you guys have just given us so much um, to think about. And I just love the stories um, from the experiences that y'all have had on the water. Um, we're going to display a quick poll for people. So if they are wanting to submit a question um, into the queue, they can do so via the Q&A function in the bottom center of the screen. And then um, while we're giving some people a chance to do that, I think our host is going to display 
one additional poll question. Absolutely, there it is. So I hope everybody can see that. So a single native Florida oyster can filter how many gallons of water each day? So everybody take a second to answer that and um, submit your questions into the Q&A function. Um, and then we will move to the, the question and answer portion. All right, do we have the results from the poll? Not seeing them yet. Oh, there it is, excellent. Okay, so you guys are brilliant. 50 gallons is the correct answer. A single native Florida oyster can filter 50 gallons of water each day, which I just find absolutely mind blowing and is just one of many super cool things um, about Florida's coastal creatures. Um, all right, so I'm gonna kick off with some questions. We've got a few that were um, submitted ahead of time. And I'm gonna start with a fishing question for Benny because we kind of ended on some of your fishing experiences in the Everglades. So what are some of the major trends that you've seen in terms of like fishing quality over the last decade? Like, have you seen more fish, fewer fish, different fish? And then where do you think it's gonna go in the next 10 years? Okay, uh, great question. Uh, super complicated answer though, uh, so I'll keep it short. We, we have definitely seen a general decline in the fish populations in the state of Florida, there's no doubt. Um, there are some success stories, however. Um, in Tampa Bay, we've seen some seagrass regrowth, and so we've had a trout population that's come back. Um, in Biscayne Bay, through efforts through some local uh, conservation organizations, we've seen conservation efforts in the Caribbean, which is where we've identified our bonefish come from, and so we have seen an uptick in bonefish populations in the last few years. Um, but generally, in the state of Florida, we, we, we are in a decline. Um, every single fishery I've gone to to highlight every single um, major guide that I've spoken to in every major estuary has said that, you know, the fishing just isn't what it used to be. And, and I think we get stuck in that, um, that mentality. You know, my dad said it was this when he was a kid and the glory days are well past. And what we're, what we understand now, what we know now is that when we do protect and save and, and restore these places, that it comes back. Uh, Mother Nature has a very resilient way of healing herself. And so um, what I, if, if I had to answer that question, I would answer it exactly like I did, but I'd also want people to understand that there is huge hope for ha having the glory days coming up. There's no reason why we can't restore and protect these places so that the fishery can get better in the future. And, um, and that's absolutely what I hang my hat on every, day, every time we go out to try to fight for some place, is that we can make it better. We absolutely can. That's great. JP, do you have any observations from your time on the water? No, and I can attest that, you know, speckled trout or, or spotted sea trout, as Benny mentioned, are definitely coming back in Tampa Bay. I caught one on Saturday where I live, and we're under a full-blown catch and release uh, in West Central Florida uh, in order to accommodate the red tide events uh, from back in 2018, 2019. Um, so management can do a lot to bring a stock back, and it's up to the managers to actually really put meaningful policy changes that will help help fix these stocks. That's great. Um, so shifting topics a little bit, you know, one of the things that we're seeing come through um, in terms of questions and that we didn't quite get to in the conversation is, is sea level rise. Um, Benny, I'm, I'm curious about your observations as how that's impacting some of the, um, you know, the environments that you see um, and, you know, where the sort of hope spots are with an issue like sea level rise. And then JP, to you, I'd love to hear, um, and some people would love to hear, you know, what are some of the policies around sea level rise that we either need to see or that has recently been enacted in Florida that are, are sort of bright spots? So a two-parter there about sea level rise. Betty, you can go ahead first if you'd like. Okay, okay sure. Um, so I can speak to a lot of fisheries um, and what sea level rise has uh, has done, but but I could, I'll use Biscayne Bay as a, an example because I believe Biscayne Bay gets looked over quite a bit. 
Um, in Biscayne Bay, we, you know, our entire sewage system relies on uh, a, basically a height above water level and, and, this, and this, this methodology that the this, this sewage would come out into a certain part of the bay based on height. And what happens when, when the sea level actually rises, the salt water is actually going back into the sewage system and causing all, all kinds of major issues in the sewage system in Miami. Um, that's the bad news. And that's just one example of what sea level rise is doing here in Miami. But the good news is that through Everglades restoration, we, the, the hope and the plan is to restore water flow into Everglades. And when we do that, we, we, we re-energize the aquifer. And the aquifer is our, our number one combatant to sea level rise in South Florida. If the aquifer is healthy, if the fresh water is replenished and it's full and it's healthy, then it actually keeps salt water penetration from uh, uh, the penetration of salt water and the sea level rise around Miami from penetrating into all of our issues in inland. And so um, while there's major problems that we're seeing, we, we have an answer in South Florida and it's Everglades restoration. So from the policy perspective, um, we had eight years in a previous administration where sea level rise and climate change was a bad word. You, in fact, weren't even allowed to say it if you worked for the state of Florida. Um, and now, you know, we are seeing some very positive steps in the right direction with respect to um, actually trying to make some meaningful, uh, you know, uh, impacts with respect to resilience. The current governor of Florida appointed a chief resilience officer, although that position is currently vacant. Um, I think it's a positive step in the right direction to making the chief resilience officer permanent and actually having this position oversee um, a lot of the restoration and shoreline restoration efforts that are going to be necessary um, coastwide in Florida. Uh, you know, we have major municipal expenditures that are forecast that are going to be required in order to deal with sea level rise. The city of Miami Beach, for example, is going to spend $400 million by 2030 just to keep their roads up above water. Um, that's just one significant municipality uh, in the entire state. We're seeing major impacts as far north, um, you know, here is St. Petersburg in the Tampa Bay area. We're seeing issues, you know, in the Keys where there are decisions, hard decisions being made as to whether or not we're going to retreat um, or abandon certain uh, infrastructure, um, whether that's roads or, or other gray infrastructure. So I think that the sheer fact that this is becoming a part of the mainstream narrative is significant because regardless of whether you come from the right end of the political spectrum or the left end, uh, sea level rise doesn't care and it's going to rise no matter what. And you know we need to be proactively finding solutions for Floridians. Um, frankly, because Florida is going to be the bellwether for the rest of the country, probably. We're seeing it first, we're on the vanguard of sea level rise. And, you know, now is the time to be working towards these proactive solutions in Tallahassee. More is needed in Tallahassee, but also on Capitol Hill. That's great. And we've got one other question from the audience, which I think is a nice lead in to the Ocean to Everglades trailer that we're going to show in a minute is, you know, what are the things that the people on this phone who are concerned about sea level rise and water quality do as members of the public um, to make a difference to help protect these precious um, ecosystems and places that, that not just Floridians care about, but, you know, everyone around the country? Yeah, well, I'll take an initial crack, but Benny, if you have some input there as well, I mean, I'm happy to uh, have you go as well. But I mean, I think, you know, a key thing in Florida is voting and voting for, um, you know, the, uh, the, the types of policy makers that are going to make proactive changes for water quality, for sea level rise, for these issues for the state of Florida, um, but also getting engaged and involved at the at the very basic level, whether that means going and talking to your local water management district and giving your input as to what you're seeing on your waterway, um, if that's talking to the South Florida Water Management District or the Southwest Florida or St. John's, whatever the case may be, I mean, we need to hear more from concerned citizens who are out there on the water and who can talk about what's actually going down in their backyards. I also want to say that um, those are excellent points, and we absolutely should do exactly that. But one thing that the average person can do every single day is to talk to the people around them about it. Um, the, the 
part of the problem is that there is just not a general awareness of uh, that sea level rise is an issue. And so obviously the people who are on this call are, are aware of it. And uh, these are the exact people who should be speaking about it. Um, it's the same thing with Everglades registration. It's the same thing with water issues in South Florida. Um, the more we talk about what they are, whether we're, whether we're educated on what the actual solutions are or not, as long as we're talking about it, then we're, we're furthering the movement. Um, that leads to getting more educated. That leads to becoming involved in your local municipality. That leads to showing up in Tallahassee and then voting correctly. Um, but we have to start talking about it first. So if there's, if there's one thing that the average person can do, and that's just to add it in the conversation, talk about it and, um, and become educated. And the cool thing, and I say this on my show all the time, is when people become educated about anything, you just learn two plus two equals four. The first thing you want to do is go tell your daughter, hey, two plus two equals four, right? So if you, if you make it a, a something that you want to talk about, then you will become educated on it. And when you become educated, the first thing you want to do is go share it with everyone. And I encourage everyone to do that. I love that. That's great. Yeah, we talk about the things that we care about. So that's um, a, a clarion call for all of us to make sure that we're talking about these issues. Um, one other question before we move to the, the trailer, recognizing that we're coming up on the top of the hour, is Red Tide. Uh, so we do have a question about um, what is the main cause for red tide, if there is one, um, and then what can we do about it? Well, I'll, I'll take an initial crack, and Benny, I'd love to hear some of your input as well, but uh, red tide is caused by a naturally occurring microorganism called Karenia brevis. Um, it's been occurring for eons. Uh, you know, it, does, it is encouraged by nutrient inputs in the water. Um, one thing I would note is that Karenia brevis is named after Dr. Karen Karenia, Karen Steidinger, who is a living researcher at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. That's a testament to how, although red tide's been around for eons, we're still t undertaking great efforts to really understand it um, as a biological phenomena. Um, but there are studies being done at University of Florida, at Florida Gulf Coast University and elsewhere that are drawing the connections between human nutrient inputs, human caused nutrient inputs and red tide blooms and outbreaks and drawing that connection and showing that um, our nitrogen and, and, and other uh, nutrient inputs can fuel and, and uh, turn a naturally occurring red tide outbreak into something that devastates the coastwide economy does you know unprecedented fish kills and you know ends up being one of those events like we saw in 2018 and 2019 in southwest florida but benny feel free to add anything um yeah that, that was a perfect um uh, i'll just you know reiterate that it is uh, it's a naturally occurring thing and um but the nutrients that we that we have constantly put into the water on our coastlines absolutely contributes to and that's, and that's what you're alluding to, that they are, they're studying that connection right now, but um, it's a pretty obvious thing to me. It's an obvious thing from the fishing community perspective, the guys who are on the water every single day. Um, when red tide starts to show up offshore, we see it. Uh, we're running our boats offshore with bait in the well. We hit the red tide line and the bait dies immediately. You know where exactly where it is. And over the course of a month, you can, you can see it coming in. You, you gradually, that line gets closer and closer and closer. And then when it hits the, the coastline, it becomes this supercharged, thing that you cannot control and that kills everything. So from a fisherman's perspective, we already have the proof. We already understand that there's a connection. And so for us, we understand that the, our nutrient outload, our nutrient load that comes from our shorelines, the legacy nutrients that exist in our soils on the shorelines are absolutely causing these major blooms. And so um, I, I, I cannot wait until the science verifies that um, so that we can start addressing that from, from a statewide perspective. Um, but until then, we're gonna, we should expect to have these major red tide blooms whenever there's a, a major water issue, major rain issue uh, around summertime. It's just going to happen. Yeah, that's great. Um, all right. So we are going to move to the Ocean to Everglades. Um, trailer that we want to show to you all. That was a great note to end on, Benny, you know, talking about the connection between the ocean and the coasts and what's happening there. And so we're really thrilled to show you all the trailer 
for the Ocean to Everglades, which is a three-part docu-series telling the story of those connections um, between the ocean, between our coastal environments in Florida, between the Everglades. And part two of the series features Benny. So Benny has not been, he's been generous with his time tonight, but he was also incredibly generous with his time um, uh, letting uh, JP ask him all sorts of questions while people were filming him. So thank you, Benny. Um, and we've got a few other environmental leaders featured throughout the film. And I also want to give a huge shout out to Isaac Mead Long, who's on the call with us today. So he's a Florida-based filmmaker who did a fantastic job directing and editing the series. You can find the entire series online at oceanconservancy.org forward slash O2E film. So we'll show you the trailer right now and then we'll come back for final thoughts from uh, Benny and JP. In the course of my work for Ocean Conservancy, I've explored every corner of Florida's waterways. I've discovered extraordinary places, witnessed amazing wildlife, and learned important insights from my fellow Floridians. The ocean and the Everglades are deeply interconnected. What happens offshore has an impact inland, and what happens here in our community has an impact out on the water. All of these ecosystems are interconnected. So the Everglades onto the mangrove forests, onto the seagrass beds, they're acting as nutrient and sediment traps and their health directly influences the ability of these corals to persist. You can't do harm to one and not think that you're not harming the others. So we're all interconnected and our waterways is, is what keeps Florida the jewel that it is. Yeah, absolutely. In 20 years, I want to see this bay healthy again. I want to see freshwater flow. I want to see communities that are educated and aware of water issues and are, are sensitive to our effects on them. And, um, and if we can get there, then, then we'll see a healthy state, a state that can combat sea level rise and climate change. great note to end on. Um, I think seeing that um, inspiring footage and, you know, the hopeful message, JP, that you and Benny share, um, you know, what is the one thing that you want people to remember from this conversation? What's the one thing that you want them to do to help Florida's oceans uh, and coasts remain the jewel that it is, as Ileana ross Lightman said? I'll go first to give Benny the last word. Um, I think it's important for Floridians and people who care about Florida, even if you're just a visitor to Florida, to, to know and, and have it sink in that all of these ecosystems are interconnected. If you're coming to Florida and you wanna to go to the beach or if you like going to the beach, the clean, healthy beach relies on clean, healthy water upstream for a clean, healthy gulf and a clean, healthy ocean and a clean, healthy reef. It's all interconnected and that interconnected is of paramount importance and it's something you should always remember as a Floridian or a visitor. I'll just add that, um, that it starts with you. Uh, it's really simple. The water in Florida is crucial to everyone who's ever been here, whoever plans to be here, who certainly the people who live here. And um, we absolutely can, can make a change. We can protect these places, we can restore these places, we can combat sea level rise with, with, with a lot of the tools we already have, but it all starts with you. 
um, I was just a fishing guy that never goes to national park who simply wanted to just put people on fish every single day. And now I've interjected myself in all these places and seeing positive change from that. And it really just starts with you. That is a perfect note to end on. Thank you so much, Benny. Thank you, JP, for a great conversation. Um, thank you to all of the participants who stayed with us for this evening. And uh, we'll be sending an email where you can watch the entire O to E series. Um, and you know, if there's questions that we didn't get to, um, which we definitely did not get to all of them, uh, we will try to, to figure out a way that we can uh, get those answered for you. So keep an eye out for your email. Again, thank you, Benny. Thank you, JP. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. See you soon. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.